get us started and introduce our illustrious speakers. We are really privileged to welcome Dr. Gabe Shamey and Dr. Gustavo Velasquez. Dr. Shamey is an associate professor in the Division of HIV, IT, and Global Medicine and has made notable contributions in the area of HIV and TB epidemiology in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly focused in transmission dynamics and behavioral economic interventions to promote prevention of HIV and TB in East Africa. And Dr. Velasquez is an, is an assistant professor also in our division whose um, most influential work is in TB therapeutics via his work with um, the NTB consortium, the Smart for TB consortium, and the ECTG evaluating new shortened regimens for TB treatment. So we are really lucky um, to have them share insights on TB management for people living with HIV this morning. And please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Shamey and Velasquez. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zappa and Imbert, for the invitation to speak and to the division for hosting. My uh, family and my kids saw this title and we're like, we didn't come up with the title, but um, they were like, are you the old dog? And I'm like, no, <laughs> shouldn't it be middle-aged dog? And I was like, all right, thanks guys. That's, that's nice. Um, all right, but it is my pleasure. I love this photo. Um, I do work, uh, Gustavo and I both work at um, both Ward 86, HIV primary care and, uh, and the TB clinic and building 90, which are adjoined, which is appropriate. So we'll be talking about some cases today. Um, so this is a case who initially presented at Ward 86 last year. And this is a 44-year-old cisgender woman from Peru who was newly diagnosed with HIV in 2022. She reported having last prior negative HIV test in 2020. In mid-2022, she immigrated to Mexico and then to Arizona. And she actually reports leaving Peru after being diagnosed with HIV due to uh, significant concerns about stigma related to her HIV diagnosis. Uh, on entry into the country, she was held by U.S. immigration and before being uh, given permission to stay with family in California and moved to California in 2022, promptly sought care and was started on ART for the first time, initiated on BIC F TAF at an HIV clinic actually outside of San Francisco, where she had first migrated to. Then in early 2023, she moved to San Francisco and she linked to Ward 86 uh, to establish HIV in primary care and underwent an intake evaluation and labs. And she reported some mild to moderate low back pain that had been going on for several years, but otherwise she said she felt uh, well, no other symptoms. In terms of her past medical history, she was diagnosed uh, with HIV, as I mentioned, in mid-2022 and started on bicaf taf Her genotype is shown with some RT uh, mutations, uh, but no phenotypic resistance, no PR mutations, no NC resistance was sent. Um, but she had a viral load that dropped from 25,000 copies uh, per ml to 99 after three months. And when they noted the 99, um, at her uh, initial clinic, she reported struggling with daily ART adherence, um, underwent some counseling. Um, her CD4 count at diagnosis was 459, 32%. In terms of other past medical history, she said she had a period of dyspnea on exertion two years ago. And she said, I, I was told I had pneumonia at that time in Peru and had some sputum obtained at a clinic, but never followed up for the results, in part because she felt better, the dyspnea resolved. Um, she was found to have a positive quantifuron test, or IGRA, the test for TB infection, in mid-2022 at the time of ART initiation in the U.S., um, but she did not receive any TB preventive therapy, and she was a chest x-ray was ordered, but she did not follow up for it, again, uh, feeling well. Uh, she had chronic low back pain um, and was found to have a herniated lumbar disc on imaging in the past. In terms of her review of systems and exam and medications, so her meds I've mentioned, only other medication with vitamin D, no allergies, or social history. Uh, she lives with her two children in a rented apartment with family. She has an occasional cigarette, but no alcohol or other drug use, and has one cis male partner who's also living with HIV and engaged in care. Notably on her review of systems, uh, she had no cough, fever, chills, night sweats, or weight loss. And these, of course, are traditional symptoms we uh, ask about in someone with a positive uh, TB infection test. Her exam is, or was, uh, normal. So normal vitals, won't go through everything, but normal uh, pulmonary, cardiac, and uh, neck exam. Um, no, uh, I didn't mention this, but no palpable tenderness to palpation uh, on the lower back. And these are her labs. Her CD4 count was 515, 37%. Uh, her RNA was now undetectable. Uh, she had normal LFTs and normal CBC and Chem7. Um, and our a QFT was repeated at Ward 86 that was positive. Okay, so this is the first audience response question. Um, so this patient uh, is asymptomatic, has a pod positive quantifuron test on uh, initial uh, clinic intake screening. So what's the next step you would take? Would you start TB preventive therapy for latent TB infection? 
Would you obtain a chest X-ray first? Would you obtain sputum for active TB evaluation first? Would you initiate active TB uh, therapy for drugs or don't know? And that uh, remind me, Joe, do I advance? I'll give it a second. Wow, it went to 114%. Okay, good. Give you guys a, a easier one to start with, which is great. So yes, yeah, so a chest X-ray would be the appropriate uh, next step. Um, uh, just to, to get a, a thorough evaluation here in this uh, high income setting. So this is a, a just a reminder that TB screening in persons with HIV, um, all people with HIV should be evaluated for TB at the time of HIV diagnosis, regardless of epidemiologic risk. Um, and a negative test for TB infection as a reminder, whether by IGRA or tuberculin skin test, uh, does not exclude TB disease. Uh, so further evaluation for TB disease, or sometimes called active TB, is necessary in people with uh, symptoms of TB disease or signs. Um, and in people with HIV who are initiating ART with a CD4 count less than 200 or a clinical diagnosis of AIDS, um, an IGRA should be repeated once uh, viral suppression and immune reconstitution are achieved. Um, notably, a positive test for latent TB infection does merit further evaluation, at least with symptom screening and chest X-ray um, and other relevant imaging uh, based on presenting symptoms, whether it's you know, neck swelling or back pain for unexplained back pain uh, before initiating TB preventive therapy in high re uh, income settings. I make this point about high resource settings and that in many settings, um, it is challenging to get additional diagnostic tests beyond symptom screening uh, in people with HIV and there are different recommendations in that context. Um, just a reminder uh, why we screen for, H for TB and, and people living with HIV. Um, TB is a leading cause of death in people with HIV globally, and TB is among the leading causes of death uh, globally. And these are data from 2019. And prior to COVID-19, TB was a leading cause of death worldwide due to single infectious disease. There's 10 million TB cases and over a million, 1.4 million deaths due to TB in 2019. Uh, this is a, a, a disease that's been around uh, for millennia um, and largely impacts the global South, including South America, Africa, and Asia. Um, but I'll just point out that um, around the world, particularly when there's um, any uh, in disruption of health and care infrastructure, an example being the civil war in Syria, um, or in uh, more recently in COVID, these are trends in absolute deaths uh, due to TB from, sorry, I got cut off here a bit, but 2000 to 2021 and the 2022 global TB report by WHO, we see an uptick in uh, estimated absolute numbers of deaths due to TB worldwide in multiple regions uh, really with uh, COVID onset. And I'll just say um, we've seen fewer and fewer people coming in for TB evaluation uh, for latent TB and screening at the TB clinic um, or did uh, in the 2020 uh, and 2021 period now rebounding, fortunately. Okay, this next slide, I just wanted to share a little bit of um, local epi, sorry, um, from California. This is a Mac to PC translation problem, so apologies for the hieroglyphics, but um, these are uh, uh, the prevalence on the upper left-hand corner, we have prevalence of TB disease um, in um, uh, the United States. And just a, a reminder that um, the bulk of TB disease we see is, uh, sorry, this is California, uh, is among people who are born outside of the United States, um, just as epidemiologic uh, uh, factor to know about TB prevalence is higher in many other countries in the world than the US. So just something, if you have patients who are immigrating to the US, it should be in, in your mind, uh, whether it's patients living with HIV or not. Um, and that TB incidence race, uh, rates by place of birth uh, do display um, uh, uh, some persistent disparities. Um, as you can see here, this is uh, non-US born uh, in red and then US born in the hatch mark. And this is, uh, these are incident rates per 100,000 person years. Um, and these are data from California uh, DPH's TB control branch uh, 2022 snapshot. I do wanna bring your attention to the right uh, box here. And this is um, the uh, prevalence of latent TB infection. It's estimated that almost two and a half million people in California have latent TB, uh, about 1.8 million of whom are non-US born. Um, but the awareness of LTBI is low at about 20% uh, and even fewer in this cascade are treated for latent TB. So a lot of work to be done. As a reminder, in case I'm diving into TB and many of you are not thinking about TB day to day, just a reminder of TB is transmitted and what the pathophysiology is. So in someone with TB um, who has pulmonary TB or laryngeal TB and is coughing uh, uh, into the air or speaking, um, you get uh, droplet nuclei. This is an airborne bacterial infection that contain TB bacilli and that they're small enough to reach 
uh, and alveolus, um, the distal most aspect of the lung in someone uh, without TB or someone with prior TB infection. Um, and of those exposed, it's estimated that about 30% of people will become infected. Um, it's estimated that about a quarter of the world's population is infected with TB. Um, and among those who get infected, about 5% will go on with primary progression, meaning they'll progress rapidly to active TB or TB disease uh, with sickness, either in the lungs or other parts of the body. If it's in the lungs or the larynx, as I mentioned, um, a person with active disease is infectious to others and keeps this cycle going. Um, for the majority of people infected with TB, they enter a stage that we consider latent TB. Um, around, um, this is about 90% of those who are infected. Um, they don't develop disease and they immunologically wall off the infection. But uh, these people can, um, of course, be uh, set up for reactivation uh, over time. Uh, the time is highest um, after infection in the first couple of years. Um, but with HIV, that risk uh, remains persistent. So we see higher rates of both reactivation and primary progression. So when we think about TB prevention and um, addressing how to interrupt transmission, really the cornerstones are infection control. So appropriate masking in people that you have uh, suspecting half TB, so they're not coughing droplet nuclei into the air and effective ventilation, which fortunately we've been thinking more about with COVID. Um, once uh, people are either latently infected um, or infected initially and caught early, TB preventive therapy, which is giving uh, one to two medications for a short time period, a couple months, um, whoops, sorry, um, is a way to prevent this progression to active TB. And then just a reminder that active TB treatment um, is critical, not only has uh, reductions in morbidity and mortality for the person living with TB, but uh, like HIV as a secondary advantage of uh, reducing and eliminating infectiousness to others after, shortly after treatment starts. So clinically, we make this distinction in several ways. When we're evaluating someone with a uh, blood test that shows TB infection, we want to try to categorize them in either latent TB or active disease. If they're latent, we want to see that someone is asymptomatic or that their symptoms can be ascribed to something else. If they have back pain, it's the herniated disc, not TB in the spine, which is POTS disease. Um, we'll rely on diagnosis of latent TB with either a tuberculin skin test or an IGRA, interferon gamma release assay, which are immune tests of our own immune system, um, basically showing uh, recognition of MTB. Uh, these are patients with latent TB are considered non-infectious and treatment, as I noted, uh, is anywhere from one to two medications for one to nine months. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about some of these shorter options. Active TB, the symptoms uh, are variable and can include cough with or without hemoptysis, fever, weight loss, fatigue, heavy night sweats, and organ-specific symptoms for extrapulmonary TB. Just a reminder, we presented earlier this year a case of someone who had no cough or presented with neck swelling that was uh, MDR TB, a uh, lymph node in this uh, neck area. The diagnosis um, often requires multiple diagnostic tests to reach a diagnosis, including smear, which is not particularly sensitive, chest x-ray to look for classic findings of pulmonary TB, the expert assay, which is a, a really um, wonderful test that's been around for about a, a little over a decade now um, on sputum that gives you a turnaround time in about two hours with P uh, PCR tests for TB. Uh, and it has a, if the MTB is detected, it'll reflex into a uh, test for rifampin resistance, which is helpful marker of uh, MDR TB. Uh, urine lamb, um, not available in the US, but worldwide, uh, a test we can use for detection of extra pulmonary TB, uh, particularly in those with advanced immune suppression. And then the gold standard remains TB culture, uh, although notably this can take up to eight weeks for results. Uh, so in terms of infectiousness, pulmonary laryngeal TB is considered infectious. And there is a difference in treatment here, of course, that this is multi-drug therapy for at least four to six months. So this distinction is important in part so we don't end up giving someone with active TB uh, monotherapy with one drug or two drugs when they need multiple drugs. Okay, so back to the case. Given the positive quantifuron uh, result, the patient underwent a chest x-ray three months after initial screening labs and nine months after initial positive quantifuron. As I mentioned, due to delayed return to clinic and her lack of symptoms, this really wasn't prioritized. Uh, given her back pain and MRIs of the spine was ordered was normal and a chest x-ray was obtained. This brings us to our next ARS question, which is assuming this patient has latent TB and she has a normal chest x-ray. So starting with that, and she remains asymptomatic and she does not want to change her ART regimen. She says, I've started on this, I've suppressed one pill a day is what I want with BIC, FTAF. What TB preventive therapy regimen would you recommend in this context? Would you offer weekly INH and B6 with rifapentine for 12 weeks, so-called 3-HP? Would you offer daily INH and B6 with daily rifapentine for four weeks or 1-HP? Would you offer INH and B6 for nine months or 9-H? daily rifampin for four months or any of the above because they offer equivalent risk reduction.
Okay. Great. So there's a couple uh, points embedded here. Uh, the majority has it. So um, the main point here is that these, although these regimens, what we'll discuss uh, shorter course therapy, as you see traditional treatment being nine months, um, because this patient, if she's expressing a desire not to change her ART, uh, we have to take caution using rifamycin. Um, so INH would be the, the drug of choice. Um, so let's go over uh, TB preventive therapy. Um, so the bulk of uh, data originally uh, was with isoniazid monotherapy. Uh, this is part of an active TB treatment regimen, but one drug, anti-TB antibiotic for six to nine months. And um, it, this results in about a 60% reduction in active TB. It's well studied in persons with HIV, and there's benefit even among those who have um, uh, virally suppressed their HIV. Um, there have been several now, uh, multiple non-inferiority trials comparing uh, tr shorter treatment uh, TB preventive therapy regimens to nine months of INH. Um, that it, and non-inferiority is demonstrated for uh, these regimens, including three months of INH and rifapentine given weekly, uh, four months of rifampin given daily, although no, notably that in this uh, one large trial, there was quite limited data on people with HIV, three months of INH and rifampin given daily, and one month of INH and rifapentine given daily. Uh, and this trial was done only among patients living with HIV. And really um, across the board, you see uh, risk reductions um, that are uh, quite large with short course therapy. And the advantage of these shorter TB preventive therapies when they can be given is a higher completion rates and lower liver toxicity uh, than nine months of INH. And you can imagine as a patient, getting your TB preventive therapy done in one month or three months, um, much often much uh, better than nine months of a, of a drug. Um, so what are the guidelines say at this point? So USDHHS guidelines say that the preferred regimens for TB preventive therapy in people with HIV are 3HP, which is weekly INH uh, B6 plus rifpentine for 12 weeks, uh, 3HR, which is daily INH B6 plus rifampin for three months with alternative regimens, including nine months of INH, four months of rifampin and one month of isoniazid and rifapentine. Do want to highlight that CDC guidelines um, do not include 1HP here of daily INH and rifapentine for four weeks as either a preferred or an alternative regimen. And I think this has delayed some uptake nationwide, um, given that the brief TB trial, which was of 1HP, was performed largely in people with HIV living in high TB burden settings. Uh, most of whom did not have testing uh, for latent TB. I do want to point out, though, that people with HIV are at higher risk of TB, regardless of testing for latent TB. And there have been trials now of people who have not tested positive for latent TB who have benefited from INH preventive therapy. Um, so there's some debate here, and you can see um, a discussion back and forth by the authors in the England Journal. But um, I'll just put my nickel down here. I agree with the DHHS guidelines, but this discordance is notable. So the move to shorter TPT regimens in patients living with HIV, um, though, has been limited mainly by uh, information about drug-drug interactions, uh, namely antiretroviral therapy and rifamycin, um, rifampin, and rifapentine, which make up all of these short-course uh, therapies outside of 9H, which is long, of course. The other issue worldwide is drug access to rifamycin, uh, particularly rifapentine. So I'm going to focus here on the far right column, I'm doing okay on time, um, of rifapentine, and just want to point out that um, for uh, NRTIs, um, you have to take care of using TAF. TAF co-administration is not recommended with rifamycin. There are some data with rifampin that although TAF levels are lower in the serum, the levels of tenofovir intracellularly are actually higher than giving TDF without rifampin. That being said, at this point, we don't consider enough data to use TAF with rifamycin if it can be avoided. Um, and patients should either be on TDF, FTC, or Abacavir and 3TC if giving rifapentine. In terms of NNRTIs, um, there are drug interactions with etrovirine, elopivirine, and duravirine with rifapentine, as well as uh, boosted PIs. Um, in terms of the INSTEs, we now have data on, uh, say, dalutegravir, or weekly dalutegravir, um, or sorry, <laughs> weekly uh, INH and rifapentine can be co-administered with uh, daily dalutegravir. I'll talk about some of those data. Um, but um, we uh, do not recommend, recommendations are uh, no rifapentine with bictegravir and cabotegravir at this time. So what is this based on? Um, these are some data on second generation, well, particularly uh, dalutegravir and bictegravir instes and rifapentine where we have data. As I mentioned, there was um, a single arm trial of 3HP and daily dalutegravir they're called the DOLPHIN trial published in 2020. Just briefly go through it that among 60 adults with HIV who were suppressed, they were placed on dalutegravir daily ART regimen for um, at least eight weeks, and then given this weekly rifapentine and INH regimen. And although uh, the rifapentine did decrease dalutegravir bioavailability by 26%, 
um, in almost all 59 of the 60, the trough levels were greater than the dalutegravir IC90. Um, all participants maintained an undetectable HIV viral load, and the authors concluded that daily dalutegravir may be given with this regimen, um, uh, which is reflected in uh, recommendations now. Uh, this should be, forgive me, but Imperial et al. presented at Croy, Padani's last author. I uh, looked at one HP and twice daily dalutegravir. This is ACTGA5372, presented a year ago uh, and a half ago. And this was dalutegravir uh, was given with uh, daily rifapentine and INH. And dalutegravir levels were monitored throughout co-administration of dalutegravir. Um, dalutegravir of note was given twice daily with rifapentine once daily uh, at 600 milligrams a day. Um, and uh, dalutegravir trough concentrations when given twice daily during 1HP remained higher than dalutegravir given daily without rifapentine. I realize this is a lot of detail, but um, hopefully you're hanging in there. Um, all dalutegravir trough concentrations remained above the dalutegravir target. Um, and there was a decline in dalutegravir troughs over uh, the course of use of rifapentine, suggesting there might be a time-dependent induction of dalutegravir metabolism during rifapentine use. Uh, the, really the only data we have uh, uh, on one HP given with big tegravir or pharmacokinetic data, I should say, uh, is from Liu et al. in 2021, um, where 48 people living with HIV with latent TB and undetectable viral loads were given one HP along with big tegravir um, with FTC and TAF. And we again, don't recommend TAF with uh, rif uh, rifapentine. Um, and just notably the proportion of uh, participants who had a big trough that remained above uh, the 95% uh, effective concentration was 56% at day 15, and by 20, uh, day 29 was 37%, uh, so really um, subtherapeutic levels. Okay, so back to the case, a chest x-ray is obtained, uh, and this is the x-ray. Uh, so this was uh, a notably abnormal, hopefully you can see that, um, and this was red, and you can see it has multifocal bilateral patchy opacities which could be due to a possible um, multifocal pneumonia or malignancy. And the uh, radiologist recommended correlation with symptoms and sputum to exclude active infection. Um, and I think you could see that clearly not a normal x-ray. So given her chest x-ray findings, three sputum samples were obtained, one induced and two expectorated for smear, expert, and MTB culture. All of the smears are negative. The one expert obtained was negative and a chest CT was obtained next. Here's the chest CT, which um, you can see is not normal. Um, it's read as having extensive calcified and non-calcified nodules, uh, measuring up to uh, 14 millimeters with architectural distortion, clustered tree and bud nodules, and per perilymphatic nodules. And they, they actually listed the differential, which included evolving infection, including TB or fungal infection. Uh, but given the presence of these perilymphatic nodes, they also mentioned sarcoidosis. Okay, so for another audience response, you have a this is now a patient living with HIV who is now, now virally suppressed on ART. She's asymptomatic. She has a markedly abnormal uh, chest X-ray and, and CT, and her smears and expert are negative. Uh, her sputum cultures ultimately return negative. So how would you proceed now? Would you obtain more sputa? Would you obtain an FNA of the pulmonary, one of the pulmonary nodules? Would you perform a bronchoscopy? Would you start TB preventive therapy? Or would you start empiric TB treatment? Give it a second. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to pause in a moment. Great. Well, I'm happy to see a spread. Um, I was worried everything I was telling you guys already knew. So um, what I would say here is that uh, I think actually multiple diagnostic tests are indicated here. It's not unreasonable to obtain more sputa, but that should be not the, only, the best answer and definitely proceeding with additional diagnostics like FNA of the pulmonary nodule uh, or bronchoscopy or both. Um, I would not start TB preventive therapy in this patient. Um, and I, you could consider empiric TB treatment, um, but I think uh, additional diagnostics are certainly merited um, as a best next step. And indeed, that's what happened. She had multiple additional diagnostic steps pursued. So more sputum was obtained, uh, given a high pretest probability of active TB based on this imaging. Uh, pulmonary nodule FNA was obtained by chest radiology. Uh, TB preventive therapy was not initiated, nor was active TB treatment pending this evaluation. Um, and histone coxy were sent, um, serologies that returned negative. Her pulmonary nodule FNA showed granulomatous inflammation was AFP positive and grew MTB. 
And actually her repeat sputa four weeks after the initial sp uh, samples still smear an expert negative, but grew uh, MTB uh, this time. It was uh, no drug resistance shown on um, molecular testing or drug sensitivity testing, it was pan-sensitive. She remained asymptomatic at this time, so no pulmonary TB symptoms. Uh, she was initiated on active TB treatment promptly, and her ART was changed to TDF, FTC, and BID, dalutegravir, given that we're administering with rifampin. I'm happy to take questions now for a second, and I'm going to turn over to Gustavo to talk about uh, this entity. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, if anyone else from the audience has questions, feel free to flag Joe down, but I'll ask you two from the chat. Um, one is how reliable do you consider quantifuron in people with very low CD4? I'll get that to you first. Yeah, and that's a, a good question. It's not as sensitive as noted, and there's a, a risk of missing someone with latent TB infection. So as I, I noted, um, highlighting the guidelines, if someone has a low CD4 count, uh, after they've been virally suppressed for a time, at least three months, or, or had CD4 count reconstitution, well, both uh, a repeat uh, screen for TB should be done with a, a IGRA. Fantastic, yeah. thank you. And then is 6-H an option at all in HIV or is that inferior? So there's good data that the longer participants that can take INH, uh, the better their protection from TB, but um, the 6-H is uh, an option, particularly if someone cannot take nine months of INH, but we do try to give nine months when tolerated. So it's a good question. Great. Thanks. Hi, Gabe. Hey, Rebecca. <laughs> uh, I have a quick question for you. What are your thoughts on 1-HP for people without HIV? We would need more data, I would think. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm curious what others in the audience would think, but, um, you know, I think between the other options that we have and that uh, given that how that was studied only in patients with HIV, I would personally be hesitant, but some may disagree with me. I'm curious what Gustavo will say as well. Thanks, Rebecca. It's a good question. I, I do want to say though, that if you're in a position where you have no alternatives, I mean, I still, I, I do think it's a, a reasonable thing to consider, but right now all of our evidence is in patients with HIV that I'm aware of. All right, Gustavo, I'm going to turn over to you. You can come up to the mic. Thank you. Thanks all for your attention. We'll be back at the end to take questions. Yeah, yeah thanks very much. So, yeah, very happy to be here again speaking to you. So, Rebecca, I'll just say that um, the Smart for TV consortium that UCSF is a part of is planning a clinical, a clinical trial in context with drug susceptible and drug resistant TB and we're and the current discussion is, is that we might try to do 1-HP as the, the regimen for contacts with drug susceptible TB. So that might provide, provide the evidence. We'll see if we can get it approved. So, um, so yeah, this was a, a very interesting case, a remarkable case we wanted to show uh, here because this patient had an obvious delay in care. Uh, you, you heard nine months before kind of coming back into clinic. Impressively, you know, had radiographic uh, evidence of TB. Now is culture positive, but actually still reported no symptoms. And so this is this entity of subclinical TB that we wanted to discuss. So this was a review, uh, and this is not reflected in any current guidelines. But it was just a group that essentially reviewed data and tried to come up with, if we had to give words to the disease states that are between latent TB and active TB, what would we call them? Um, so they came up with this idea of incipient TB and subclinical TB, and you can see subclinical TB is same as active TB, just the difference is that people don't have symptoms. Incipient TB is even earlier than that, which is that you actually can't, you look, but you can't actually find evidence of tuberculosis in their x-ray or any other part of their body, um, and you can't culture it. So... Um, TB disease is a spectrum, and like real life, it's, it's complicated. Um, we talk about latent TB and active TB just like Dr. Chami did, um, and it's very useful, clinically useful, especially when we're kind of discussing risk with patients, what regimens we want to give them. But the reality is somewhere um, a little bit more complicated. Einstein was credited with saying everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. I, I think this is a, an example of something that the simplest explanation might be still too complicated. Um, I did want to highlight here that, uh, you know, if just to look through a couple of these trajectories, which we've already gone over, uh, if, if this is disease burden on the y-axis over time since infection on the x-axis, so the minority of people, those 5% of people that develop primary TB, that 
they go straight from infection to uh, symptoms and disease versus people that have rapid or slow reactivation. But then there's um, in the old literature, the uh, uh, not particularly patient-centered um, word for, for the cyclic disease might have been something called a chronic excreter in very old literature, which is just people who have chronic TB disease and they might kind of be intermittently infectious uh, over long periods of time. And then the vast majority of people who have latent TB kind of flatline there at the bottom, which is, you know, people can die with living active, or sorry, living latent TB and not actually have any symptoms from it ever. So subclinical TB is basically right there below the, the symptom threshold uh, blue line. So um, again, um, it's, we, it's a simplification. Now, here's a question which, um, you know, we saw this case, we thought it was remarkable, but how common would you think that subclinical TB would be among notified cases in high burden settings? And so there's data to back this up and that's why I wanted to ask this question. Um, less than 10%, greater than 80, what do you think? This is interesting. Um, okay, so most people think, right, like the 80-20 rule. So people are going towards the 20 rather than the 80. Um, so there was a really interesting study uh, published in CID in 2021, which looked at these prevalence surveys that are done across the world anyway by countries just to figure out how much TB they have. And they focus specifically on countries, uh, national surveys and subnational surveys in Africa and Asia. And the median was 50% um, of, of cases found in those prevalent surveys uh, had subclinical TB. And the interquartile range was actually 36 to 80. And you can see that there in red and blue um, at the top figure uh, in terms of um, how, how each country kind of um, reported subclinical TB in those prevalent surveys. And the way that they ascertained pre um, subclinical TB was essentially people found to have tuberculosis, but they actually reported no symptoms at that moment. Um, another interesting finding related to um, HIV in that paper is that they looked at the HIV prevalence across these countries. And, and as um, you know, HIV prevalence in these particular countries might go up, uh, that didn't have a particular association with the percentage of subclinical TB that was reported. Um, that flies in the face a little bit of observational studies, which in general have you know, smaller, much smaller studies have generally shown that HIV might actually be a risk factor for subclinical TB, and in particular before people are receiving ART. Um, and then the second bullet, I just couldn't help but just give a shout out to uh, one of ours, so Andrew Kirkhoff. Um, there's also observational studies that um, that show, or at least suggest, that that there might be progression um, of subclinical TB. Uh, to active TB in people living with HIV that can be anywhere from days after detection to weeks and months. Um, and so it can actually be pretty quick. And so then the question for our patient is, we saw her, she didn't um, have symptoms at the time. How long would she have been asymptomatic in the community before she would have developed symptoms and then had true kind of full active TB? So, um, so now I'm just going to transition into talking about treatments uh, because we wanted to talk about new tricks, right? So, uh, so new treatments for drug susceptible TB and the easiest and biggest one to talk about, uh, which um, has been we presented briefly in in March um, uh, this year as well, is the four month treatment for TB. So this is the rifapentine moxi regimen. So. Um, TBTC study 31 ACTGA 5349 was a trial that um, was an RCT phase three open label non-inferiority design compared the control arm, which is at the top, the regular six months of treatment for uh, active drug susceptible TB versus in the middle of rifapentine regimen, it just substituted rifampin for rifapentine and shortened it to four months or a rifapentine moxie regimen, which um, again, replaced uh, rifampin with rifapentine, shortened the duration to four months, and then also further replaced the ethambutol with moxifloxacin. And that was what made headlines that the, it was only the rifapentine moxie regimen that showed non-inferiority in the quote unquote um, MITT and per protocol populations. Um, and uh, also in all the, the pre-specified subgroup analysis or sensitivity analyses as well. Um, and you can see there that in terms of overall unfavorable outcome, it was 14.6 in the control 
and 15.5 in the RIF moxie, uh, RIF benzene moxie arm. Um, and it showed an inferiority with a margin of 6.6%. Um, and there was a subsequent subgroup analysis, and this, this was a very large trial with thousands of people, but, uh, but the subgroups that were small that had HIV, so 64 in the control arm, 62 in the HPZM arm, uh, median CD4 counts of about you know, mid 300s, and everybody was on, or most people received a favorin spaced ART within eight weeks of enrollment. And, uh, and you can see that uh, grade three events and treatment related events were relatively similar. And again, here the forest plot at the bottom shows that in the subgroup with HIV, uh, the regimen was also shown to be non inferior um, at the same margin in both um, MITT and per protocol populations. So this just says basically we, you know, we can confidently use four months of, of HPZM um, as a regimen. Um, so now uh, let me see if I can go back here. Is this, I hope this is live, but the, the question that we wanted to ask is which, um, when we think about the four month regimen, HPZM, so again, it has rifapentine and moxie, which ART core drugs would be approved, are currently approved for the treatment of drug susceptible TB when you're using HPZM. Um, so I hope it's live and please vote. And give it a second. So basically the question is ephavrins or um, insties or all the above or big tiger beer in particular. <clears throat> This is really good to see because we can talk about it. So most people are saying favorins and dalutegravir or with raltegravir or all, you know, dalutegravir, raltegravir and favorins. So in fact, it's actually just if favorins is approved. Um, so <clears throat> CDC, after this uh, paper came out, um, published their interim guidance last year. And, uh, and they said very clearly that you know, more studies are needed in, in the populations in which uh, these regimens are not recommended. And so they are not, they did not recommend it in people living with HIV who are taking non efavirenz based regimens. And so again, efavirenz was the only allowed ART in that study. It's, it's kind of remarkable because TB trials take so long, right? This is dated um, ART at this point. Um, but just to show uh, what, what Gabe showed before here that, um, if you look at raltegravir and dal dalutegravir in this rifapentine column, there's an asterisk. It's actually only approved for weekly, uh, with weekly rifapentine. And what was the rifapentine that was used in HPZM? It was actually daily uh, 1200 milligrams, right? So that is a way bigger dose of rifapentine. And then the question is, would that induce a lot more metabolism of these insties? And, and then kind of what, what would be the dose that we would need to give? And so, there will be a solution to this. Uh, there is a study that opened last month um, at ACTG. It's, uh, I looked last night or two nights ago, and it, it's, uh, it's not accrued any patients yet, and you'll see why. Uh, it's going to be hard to enroll, but they only need 20 evaluable, uh, so 30 total people is what they're planning to enroll. These will be adults with uh, living with HIV who are not on ART and are diagnosed with tuberculosis. They will start the green regimen, which is the four months of treatment for TB, and then after a lead-in period, six weeks, they'll start uh, twice daily dalutegravir, then have intensive PK, finish TB treatment, come down to daily dalutegravir, have another intensive PK visit. And so the idea is this study will, you know, the PK findings from this will, will be able to inform what is the optimal dose of dalutegravir with HPZM. Okay, so um, let me look at the time. So I think... Now, another new trick. Now, this one is not in guidelines and, uh, <laughs> and you'll see why, but, uh, but can we use two month treatment, right? So perhaps uh, at, from Croy this year, you would have seen headlines about uh, two month treatment for TB. What, what do we think? So this is truncate TB. So this was a, a trial, a very unique uh, trial that uh, compared standard treatment, which they said was 24 weeks here in, in our TB clinic, that's a bit short. Our treatment is 26 weeks, but regardless, six months of st standard treatment versus eight weeks. Um, and so 
the important thing to know when you think about this trial is that what they were testing wasn't really an eight week regimen and done. It was really a week, eight weeks of treatment, but really a two year kind of follow up strategy, right? So, um, so they gave people eight weeks of treatment. They had criteria by which they would extend treatment to 10 to 12 weeks if there was uh, evidence of persistent clinical disease. And then they, the whole follow-up period for those participants was 96 weeks, two years. And then they followed them with symptoms and smear very closely. And if they had any evidence of uh, recurrent disease, they, they put them on a full six months again. So, so the most that they could get would then be eight. Uh, so two, two months plus six months, so eight months uh, during that period. And then the primary outcome was at 96 weeks, did they die? Did they still have active TB or were they still on treatment at 96 weeks? Which again, if you think about it, uh, you know, being on treatment two years after you started is um, quite, quite a suboptimal outcome. So I want you to just focus on the, reg the regimen that made it to non-inferiority, which is in red at the bottom. That's a bedaquiline and linazolid regimen. I'm not going to talk about the other ones. Um, so this was a regimen that used the FDA uh, approved bedaquiline dose, which is a 14 day load at 400 daily and then it goes to 200 three times a week for eight weeks. Isonizid, uh, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. So notice there's no rifampin, or no rifamycin at all. And then it added um, a fifth drug, which is linaz linazolid 600 once daily, um, which is half of what we give people with uh, MRSA or pneumonia here. Um, very important. So this is why it, uh, it is not applicable to people living with HIV is that they excluded people living with HIV at the beginning, then they changed their mind at the very end of the study, they made a protocol amendment. And, uh, and unfortunately, despite that, by the end of the study, they didn't actually enroll anybody living with HIV. Uh, but this was active pulmonary TB. And then these were the findings. So the strategy for this arm showed non-inferiority with respect to that 96 week primary outcome um, with a margin that they had set of 12%. So 5.1% was the upper limit of the confidence interval. So it was not inferior. And you can see what the percentage uh, favorable out or yeah, unfavorable outcome was in, in the two arms, uh, three-ish to five-ish percent uh, across them. Um, and they did subgroup analyses. Again, there's no HIV because there were no patients with it, living with HIV in that study, but um, across subgroups, uh, it was kind of this, there was no subgroup that, that had kind of differential outcomes. But here's the kicker, and here's why this is actually not a new trick right now, at least in my opinion, which is that 3% um, of people in the control arm had retreatment, and that is, you know, pretty I think expected in a clinical trial for standard treatment for TB. But I mentioned that, um, that really it was a strategy over 96 weeks. And so people were allowed to be retreated and still have a favorable outcome as long as at the two year point, they still weren't on treatment for TB, which is very likely to happen anyway. But um, look at that number, 13% of people in that non-inferior bedaquiline linazolid arm actually needed to be retreated and got a full six month treatment for TB after the eight weeks. Um, so, you know, when programs are looking at this, right, wherever you are, uh, this means that, you know, you might be able to get away with giving some people, um, a lot of people, eight weeks of treatment, but that means that you actually have to commit to following the rest very, very closely for two years. Um, and you're over, you know, one in 10 are actually going to need to be retreated. So, that's, um, you know, for lack of a better expression, a big pill to swallow. So I think uh, it's, uh, I don't think that this is going to make um, guidelines in, in a favored way anytime soon. And then what about the regimen itself? So I changed this column or added this column BLHZE. That's, I guess, how you would abbreviate the regimen from truncate. Um, it has some features that actually might be um, might be useful because rifamycins are such a problem with drug-drug interactions. So the bedaquiline does have its own concerns. Like for example, NNRTIs are, are a no-go with, uh, with bedaquiline often, but for rilpivirine in particular, um, it, there's just a question about QT prolongation with rilpivirine. So for people who are on, on long-acting cabril, then um, they would just, you know, because bedaquiline also prolongs the QT interval, you'd probably have to set up some monitoring for uh, QT. But uh, you can see that for INSTEs, um, actually there wouldn't be a problem at all. 
So, um, so it, would, it would be compatible from that perspective. Um, now, moving on, this is now, so we've talked about an actual new trick, um, a, a kind of a new trick that I don't think will make it to guidelines. And now here's maybe a future new trick. So this is stratified medicine drug susceptible TB. So this is a study that we are, uh, a big group is planning um, at the AIDS clinical trials group and it's led largely by folks from UCSF. And so I'm calling it a two and a half to six month treatment. Um, and I'll explain why. So in blue are all the folks from UCSF that are involved, uh, largely um, so led by Payam Nahid and Patrick Phillips, and then Radha Savic and I are co-investigators and, and um, her trainees. Uh, and so, the, the main idea is behind this trial is stratified medicine. So the idea is that we have pooled, especially Rada's lab has pooled over 6,000 participants in drug susceptible TB trials, failed trials, successful trials. Um, it's very clear, and I think clinicians can just tell you this uh, without blinking an eye, that there is a, a, a clear spectrum to TB disease severity. And we talked about it with subclinical TB earlier. In these trials, if you try to kind of count how many people are hard, have harder to treat TB versus easier to treat, it's the minority really that have harder to treat TB between 18 to 25% in these trials. So what this means is that if you think about how we design the trials and non-inferiority trials, we're really over-treating three quarters of the population that we enroll in the trial so that we can then get a non-inferior outcome and then have a successful regimen that then becomes guidelines, right? So um, in other words, we're powering these entire trials for the harder to treat population, because that's really who gives us a signal. And this is an example from the study 31, a 5349 trial, the four month HPZM trial. So I showed you that it was not inferior when everybody's put together, but if you actually dissociate those groups into low, the lower risk group and the, and the higher risk group, if you, know, you can just imagine, the data shows us here that if we had done a trial only in the higher risk participants in study 31, we would not have a four month regimen today because 10.5% um, of the HPCM arm would have had uh, unfavorable outcomes. The 7.5% in the control would have unfavorable outcomes. And if you just think about those numbers as well, those are pretty unacceptable numbers for TB treatment anyway, right? Like we don't want 95.92.5% uh, cure. We want higher than that. So then what can we do in terms of a clinical trial to make things better? So this is a design of Spectra right now. Um, so the idea is that we would enroll people with drug susceptible TB and upfront stratify them into harder or easier to treat TB. And so in the harder to treat group, again, the goal is to get as good of outcomes as we can. So we kind of cut our losses and say, we're not going to try four months. We're just going to give them six months of HPZM. We're trying, we're kind of shooting for gold. For the easier to treat group, then the question is, the equipoise is, what is the actual duration of treatment that people need if they have easier to treat TB? And so this is a duration randomized trial and it ranges, so people will be assigned to 10, 12, 14, 16, or 18 weeks of treatment um, with HPZM with one modification, which is that we also looked at the rifapentine dose and we think that we can get away with a slightly higher flat dose of 1500 of rifapentine for not, um, not much um, increase in safety based on our analysis of study 31. So this is what we're proposing. It's gonna be 900 people, it's gonna take a while, uh, but, uh, but we're hoping that this can be more quote unquote personalized treatment for tuberculosis. And in terms of the risk stratification algorithm, this is what we currently have. Uh, again, the protocol has not yet reached 1.0, but the main takeaway is that in blue, the biggest risk factor in study 31 for unfavorable outcome was actually the rifapentine exposure, so the PK. Um, we won't be measuring rifapentine PK in this trial. So the, the markers of that actually were uh, uh, if people uh, were living with HIV, because that was a marker of clearance of rifapentine, or sex, which is a marker of bioavailability of rifapentine. And then other risk factors, which were direct risk factors of clinical outcome, which included the cycle threshold on experts. So this is basically kind of, uh, you know, the newer generation smear grade. So just like how much, uh, you know, the cycle threshold and expert, which I think we're all familiar with now from COVID, BMI, age, diabetes, and then uh, the extent of disease on chest radiograph as well. 
And so this will be the baseline algorithm that then will stratify people into the arms that they are eligible for. So uh, just to wrap up now uh, and kind of come back to the case. Uh, so this patient didn't get four month uh, treatment because they uh, actually she switched to TDF, FTC and BID dolutegravir, which is pretty standard for the standard regimen for TB, which is um, HRZE or RIPE. Uh, she remains well engaged in care, um, HIV, is undetectable and she's culture negative and is uh, approaching the two month mark and will switch to two drug therapy soon. Um, so today we talked about a lot of things TB related. Uh, hope we gave you an idea of some new tricks, uh, but bottom line, um, all people with HIV should be evaluated for TB period um, at the time of HIV diagnosis. There's several preferred regimens for TB preventive therapy in people living with HIV, and, and there are alternative regimens. There is this uh, controversy about 1HP in particular that is in some guidelines, but not others. Um, so we are not using it, for example, in TB clinic. Um, and I'm not aware of anybody receiving it in 46 right now, I wanna say. Uh, um, uh, and so then um, subclinical TB is quite common in about 50% of notified cases in high burden settings. There is a four month treatment for, uh, for TB. Uh, right now, only if Favarance is approved, which is kind of a big limiting factor for us using it here. Uh, but, uh, but we hope sometime soon we'll have uh, trial evidence showing what the best dolutegravir dose would be for that. And then um, there was, Truncate showed a two month treatment for, uh, for TB. It was not inferior to control, it's, but uh, at least in my opinion, it's not ready for prime time. And when guidelines come out, they're expected uh, January of 2024. We'll see if how they're how the guidelines mention that regimen. Um, um, so anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for a fantastic talk. Joe has one microphone in the back, and I have another one. Anyone? I'll start with the audience. See if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Gustavo. I have a question about the harder to treat TB and the, the algorithm used. Yeah. I saw that you had um, expert ultra cycle threshold, but we don't have that here in California. And just curious about how to think about, you know, from a clinical perspective, how to put people into harder to treat. Cause I know also for study 31, we're treating people with cavities. Yeah. Uh, great, great question. So, um, so study 31 was also dated in that way that um, the expert cycle thresholds that we had to build the algorithm were actually the initial, it's called like the 2.0, the legacy cartridge for expert MTB RIF. Um, but there have also been studies that have correlated the 2.0 cartridge, the legacy cartridge which, with the ultra cartridge, which again, is just the uh, cartridge that goes into the same machine. It's just a, a better cartridge. So, um, so we walked it over. So we, we built the algorithm and then walked it over to ultra cycle thresholds because there is a, a bit of a difference. So I think the algorithm would be robust to whatever you're using. The reason why it's ultra in um, ACTG is actually because all the ACTG labs have upgraded to ultra. So we, we're kind of planning for the future. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. I'll ask one from the chat or... Okay. Okay. Um, we have a question, terrific talk. Could you remind us of recommendations for follow-ups, sputum culture um, and PCR after starting TB therapy for active disease? Okay. Um, so, well, uh, you know, in, in general, it's the, the two month, I will just highlight the two month uh, time point is critical um, because um, there is data from, an older study now, it's called study 22, a CDC study that, that showed that, you know, positive culture at two months and cavitary disease is a risk factor for relapsed disease. And so uh, in clinic, we, we focus a lot on the two month culture in particular um, to make clinical decisions about, for example, six month treatment, extending it to nine months. Um, but we, you know, we do it at two months, uh, we do it at six months, um, we do have a protocol for the HPZM regimen. So again, for people, it's going to be largely people without HIV in our clinic, but we do have a, a whole protocol for more intense culture um, in, in that group because we're, we're still getting kind of experience with that regimen. Not a little bit. Oh, 
Although we look at the two month culture, as Gustavo indicated, we uh, the TB clinic will be typically checking cultures more frequently just to document first sputum culture and activity prior to two months as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thanks. I'm so glad you mentioned the two month study that was presented at CROI. Mm. Um, it really made all of us think about a lot of things. And I mean, the bottom line is we over treat a lot of people. So we're trying to figure out how we don't over treat so many people. And the reaction, well, that's too hard. We can't follow people. Like when you juxtapose that to you, you might have six different durations of treatment that you figure out in a study. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's just kind of at odds of that, mm -hmm. just to kind of state the obvious. So that was one thing. I mean, I love that study. I think it's fantastic. We'll learn a lot. Sometimes I think it has to be simple. We really kick ourselves in the foot with that. And we, under, we really underestimate what health systems can do. I guess the other thing for the trial is how, how are you addressing the idea of patient taking their medicine? You know, maybe, I don't know if we should go there with the DOT, what the HIV field thinks of the DOT uh, terminology, but like part of it is, is the patient really taking the medicines? How do we really know? And we're trying to shorten the regimens. Maybe you can, the first one was more a comment, mm -hmm. just a reflection. The second one is how are you dealing with that in the study? Yeah. Um, thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. And I just want to say that, um, and I should have been more clear for the for the the trial itself. The goal is actually to get a single duration for easier to treat. It's just duration randomized to figure out which one would be the best. Um, so it might, not be the best for everybody. it might well, right? It might not be the best for everybody, and and that's the reality, right? It's then we have an algorithm, and then we have to make it better. Uh, yeah, but yes. Um, I think um, for the second point, um, how do we manage DOT in the in the studies themselves? Was your question? Like commenting on how like yeah. adherence and how that plays into the idea of shorter courses. Yeah, I mean the the standard in these studies is always going to be five out of seven day DOT because that's how we generally do it. But that's because that's kind of the the flavor of DOT that ACTG likes to do um, with uh, unobserved. Uh, doses on the weekend or holidays or travel, um, you know, but there, there's other groups that are way more invested into like the, you know, like the MERM, the, the pill boxes uh, and kind of assisted adherence uh, de devices. Um, but, uh, but yes, I, I think, you know, there, there's also the, the concern, right? Like, are people taking it? Should you do, should we be doing, um, you know, things like, you know, should we push the standard of care and do and plan, you know, and say we, we actually do need therapeutic drug monitoring and TB, right? And to make it simpler uh, to do uh, so that we can do it everywhere in the world. That, that's always kind of a discussion, especially when we're designing these studies where we're kind of already assuming we're not going to get, for example, uh, a rifapentine level. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a really big implementation question too. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one for you, if we can end on that, which is you mentioned drug interactions between cabotegravir and the rifamycins and bedaquiline. Do you have an approach to patients living with HIV on cabotegravir, relpivirine, needing treatment for active TB? Yeah. Um, so, so I mentioned you know, the, the, the concern with four month treatment would just be the ropibrine and, and QT prolongation of bedaquiline. The standard treatment doesn't prolong the QT. So I'm not aware, Gabe, are you, that there would be a, a major problem with Cabro? Everybody's getting an earthquake alert. Oh. Yeah. Um, I just add that with Cabinuva, the issue, of course, would be both ropibrine and cabotegravir. So it would, I mean, for the duration of TB treatment, okay. yeah, for yeah. Cabinuva, it would right. be, you know, considering yeah. you, you need rifampin, so you'd be considering adjustment or rifapentine if you went on a shorter course. Um, so you'd have to, we'd, we'd want to figure out a way to treat someone for HIV during that window without injectables. Challenging, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, good question. Right. So like the TDF, FTC, and BID dolly would be the standard. Just a good thing to think about though in general, because we've seen a couple instances where people are not totally checking the drug-drug interactions in general, including antiretrovirals. You just take care before just jumping on a 
uh, LTB, uh, T, TBT, TBT regimen or TB treatment regimen without looking carefully through drug-drug interactions, which hopefully is clear through this talk. So I want to take a moment too. I think both Gustav and I just want to acknowledge both the Ward E6 clinical staff, the inpatient service, and all the help. I see the pharmacists here, and, and a huge thank you to the Ward 94 TB clinic um, and uh, Janice Louie is medical director, as well as um, Ali Phillips and Hi, uh, who uh, helped with this uh, case. And so thank you. Thank you all so much, and stay safe, everybody. We're quite alert. Thank you. Um,